And you may have realized or you may have heard that I irritated some people with my first ghost controls. Can we even say that or do we have to call them spooky controls now? I'm not really sure. They haven't said I can't say their name, but they did say I need to be very accurate and very methodical about the way I discuss their products. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at their video and we're going to correct some errors and clarify where maybe there was a little bit of confusion. So we're going to do that right now. It's Dan with SWI. Welcome back to our playground. Yes, this area right here is our playground where we're going to demonstrate things to you that we want you to see. This is one of the things that we want you to see. We're going to demonstrate this gate. We're going to put an actuator arm on it. We're going to make this gate automated. We're going to show you everything not to do. We're going to show you everything that we don't do. Why can we do this? Because we're doing it for ourselves for a demonstrational video so that that way if you run into this stuff, you know the difference between right and wrong. One of the things I haven't been very good about on this channel is asking you guys to like and subscribe. You know what? 99% of our views come from people that are not subscribed to our channel. If you like this comment, one of the best things you can do to help support this channel is subscribe, give us a thumbs up, write a comment down below, tell us what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong. So take a minute right now and do those couple things and then let's get into this video review because I think you're gonna like what I have to say or maybe you're not. Before we get too far into this, I need to say all the views and opinions that are stated here are mine and mine alone. They're my opinion and this is an opinion piece. So if you don't like that, maybe click on to the next video. But you're gonna get my opinion and that's what this channel is about. It's me and I feel like I get to say my opinion on my channel. But don't get mad at me because I have an opinion. And to be very clear, Dan is playing the role of a homeowner who is installing a product that he got from a box store not saying that this is how Spooky Controls recommends installing their operators. And that special code is UL325, and we follow it. But today, we're not gonna follow that code. To get started, we're gonna drive these two wood posts in with our Evo. So if you're gonna put an operator on a gate, everything tells you, everything must be level. Your gate needs to be level, your operator needs to be level. In this case, this gate's not level. Uh, down a little bit. There it goes. In all fairness, we do need to make sure that our gate does swing freely before we start messing with our operator and put our operator on it. Because that's not any credit to anything. We, you do need to have a proper functioning gate for an operator to work properly. So now we got our gate up. We got uh, more pieces up here on the ground. It's a nightmare. We'll talk more about the, the level and the hinges here in just a little bit because I did touch on that. But your gate does need to be level. It does need to swing freely. And um, we'll talk about the hinges here in a minute because there was some discussion on that in a letter that I got from Spooky Controls. Uh, but for now, we'll just go ahead and keep playing. So we're gonna do it, and we're gonna do it together. This is our main motherboard right here, and I'm used to ones that are twice the size of that. So first things first, let's figure out how we get this thing on there. So how does this thingy attach? Those thingies to those thingies? And just, yeah, put your bolt in there, and then we'll move this thing around. What does that do? This is really driving me crazy. What I would really like is if they would have given me another post and I could have put my, my control board on a whole different post. Spooky Controls does not provide the post at all. That is the responsibility of the homeowner. What Dan is illustrating right here is exactly what we see when we go out into the field and that is that the homeowners will install the controls on the post that the gates uh, hang off of and latch to. So all the controls will be hung right off of that stuff because it's close and it's convenient. There is nothing in the manual that says Ghost Controls does not recommend putting the controller on the post. And on the other post, later on in the video, you'll see that the keypad is attached to the latch post. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. This is exactly what we see. The homeowners are gonna install these gates, uh, the gate operators and the controls on the post that exists right there. That is not the responsibility of Ghost Controls to provide. That is your responsibility. If you want it on a second separate post, we suggest that you get another post and you put it on a separate post. That is not Spooky Control's responsibility. Really wish they would have given us a whole nother post. That would have been that would have been really nice. All right, let's wire this bad boy up. No fuse. Yes, there is a fuse. It's stuck in the receiving side. Well, the thingy doesn't fit, and I don't have other thingies. I'll say. I think this is going to keep it charged for a good week or two. Okay, are you ready to mount that thing? Yeah, where do you want to face it? 
It needs to face the sky. Okay. I know that. Never eat shredded wheat. So west. Everything is good in the west. You don't think a you don't think a car is gonna come through the gate and get snagged on that, do you? Probably not. Probably not. Okay. There should be like a rule that I'm not allowed to go get any special tools out of my truck. They did provide me with a screwdriver. I will just say that's awesome. It gives you a nice little tune to like make you feel so good about yourself that you just got a brand new gate operator. That feeling is usually short lived by the way. Okay, I don't know which one is open and which one is closed. Um, it does not specify. I have a 1G and a 2G. Let's see. That's for two separate gates, I think. You can operate two individual operators with each one with each button. Device. I don't know how it would make it through the cold temperatures. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. I couldn't tell you. So we need two C batteries. They're killing my budget. They didn't even give me batteries. This gate's costing me a ton of money. So my customer that I'm doing this for, they want this keypad as close to the gate as possible. So that's what they're gonna get. Right here. Man, our thing is really coming together. My keypad works. We'll talk more about the keypads here in a little bit. Wired vehicle sensor. Never seen one like it. Because we're used to a safety loop. What a safety loop is, is it's a loop in the ground with a magnetic field detecting vehicles. There needs to be one on one side, but normally they get installed with two loops. It senses your vehicle and tells your gate when the car is there, and it reads if anything is there. If there's a vehicle over the loop, that gate's not going to close until that vehicle moves. What they say this thing does as well, but I've never seen one. It's not, normally it's a loop in the ground. I have a vehicle detection probe down there, okay? Is this thing UL325 compliant? What's that? Yeah, exactly. What's that? I want to be very clear here. These gate operators do meet UL325, barely. And when I say barely, that means that they've got the inherent trap and sensor, which I talk about here in a little bit, and then they have another uh, sensor inside the operator itself, that uh, force limiting sensor. So those two devices make it UL325 compliant. Now there, I think it's them and maybe one other manufacturer that are using this particular uh, feature. UL says that they have to have an external sensor and because the operator is external, they're considering that one of their external sensors. So yes, they're meeting the bare requirement for UL325. However, we do not feel that that's adequate, nor does the industry as a whole because nobody else with the exception of maybe one or two other manufacturers are using this uh, method to stop and control a gate to keep it from crushing or damaging uh, properties. Just to make that clarification, Spooky Controls here is 100% UL325 compliant because they fought very hard to make sure that their sensor was approved, but nobody else is using that same method. We wonder why. You can't just come and throw numbers at me expecting to make that a code. That's not a code. The customer is going to rotate it as they need. Yeah, you can rotate it so you can follow the sun all day long. That's why they give you a pipe. This is just awesome. We're just being silly there, by the way. Just being Stop silly. It. Stop. Close. Stop. But we're going to talk about why this operator is not at all what the professional grade operators will be. What sets this consumer grade operator apart from a commercial pro grade setup? Because it's consumer grade and they anticipate that people are gonna be installing these that don't know a lot about operators, don't know a lot about the systems and how things work, they really do try and dumb this down as much as they possibly can. And in order to do that, one of the biggest things that they do is they make this operator so that it will operate without having all the proper safety devices. I am saying proper in my opinion, the proper safety devices. This, as we mentioned before, this gate operator is 100% UL325 compliant. That does not mean that I feel this is a safe installation and there are devices that are necessary for a safe installation, which this operator does not require to be installed. And as we will talk in a little bit, 
some of these items are not even mentioned or available through this manufacturer. What does that mean to you as a consumer or the end user? That means that it's opening you up to liability should this thing hurt someone or something. That's 100% accurate. If we touch that operator and we're the last ones to touch it and it damages someone or something, then we accept any responsibility as well as you as the homeowner accept responsibility for the damage that that does to somebody else's property. So that's gonna be a claim on your homeowner's policy. If somebody's coming to visit you and that gate closes on them and does damage to their vehicle, that is 100% on you. Not their vehicle, it's not their fault, that's on you. So just realize there's some big blind spots to this thing and if it damages somebody's property, that's gonna cost you. Decided to follow UL325 strictly and make sure that the operators that we're touching are uh, compliant. So if you bring us out to your property, one of the first things we're gonna do is look at that thing to see if it meets all the safety standards and if it doesn't, we're not gonna touch it unless you're willing to bring that operator up to say the uh, UL325 safety standards. So you can see that the box is very simple. I, we have a video up on our YouTube channel where we show our solar setup compared to this. So we can kind of compare these. And this is very typical of what we see when we show up on a site and somebody says, well, I have a gate operator, it's not working. We see that we have just the minimalist solar panel set up. So this is a 10 watt solar panel, may or may not be adequate depending on how many cycles you uh, are using your gate for a day. But these consumer grade operators are not gonna talk anything about that. Okay, to be very clear, they do talk about this, but it's buried in the details. And they're assuming that when a consumer's walking through the store, they're gonna see the operator, they're gonna see the solar panel, and they're gonna assume, make the huge assumption that if that solar panel's being sold by that manufacturer and it's right next to the operator, that if they get those two items, that they'll be good to go. And that is not at all the case. Now, if you get into the details, and once you buy the operator and you start digging through your manual, the manual talks a little bit more about what kind of zone you're in and how many days of sun that you can expect and how many cycles a day and what kind of hardware you put on it, which becomes very important because some of the hardware, if you start really digging into spooky controls, some of the hardware is not even recommended or it says you cannot install on a solar operator. Those are the things you have to worry about. They do talk about what kind of solar power you will need to operate their controller. The other thing we find interesting is, is that the solar panels that the farm stores and the big box retailers are carrying are the cheaper ones. Now they make another solar panel, but most of the places don't sell that because it's more expensive. And we're gonna get a little bit more into the cost side of things and how they were upset with me about the cost, which I thought was pretty funny here in a little bit. Put the solar panel on it, put a couple batteries on it, and you're good to go. Other things that people don't realize when they get into these systems is they go into the farm store or wherever you're looking at these and they say, oh, you know, you look at this arm and you think that that's all there is to it. You don't realize that there's the arm and then you have to buy the controller and then you have to buy the battery box and you have to buy the solar panel separate. And if you want to lock on that end of the gate, that's separate and remotes are separate. And what we have down here is a probe and that's separate. And so they look at the cost of this particular piece and think, oh, my fence company is ripping me off because I can go down and get this stuff and it's super cheap and the $500 and I'll have an operator. There's a lot more to the system than that. And that's not what you're seeing. By the time we get all this stuff included, you know, we've got $1,500 wrapped up in just this. Here's where we get to talk about cost. I thought it was really interesting that when they sent me the cease and desist letter, that they were all wound up about the fact that the stuff that I have shown in the video did not cost $1,500. I apologize, I was shooting the video. I don't have script for anything. I was approximating cost that did not cost $1,500. They were very clear in the fact that it cost $900 and, hang on, I'm gonna be very accurate. It cost $940.57 according to them. I don't know, I could pull out the receipt. Maybe I should do that too. For all the hardware that we have shown here in this video, we spent $865.75, so even they were a little bit off. What I find interesting about this is that I represented that their product was more expensive, thereby insinuating that maybe it was a little bit higher quality than they did. What I think that they were irritated with me for is the fact that I was telling people, the consumers, that the product was more expensive than it really was. And that kind of goes to their mindset and that they really want their 
product to seem cheap and affordable because they want everybody to put one of these on their gate. So they were irritated with me that I represented that it cost more than it actually did, but it's 100% true. So you have to buy the actuator arm, you have to buy every single individual remote, you have to buy the battery box, you have to buy the solar panel, you have to buy the keypad, you have to buy each individual probe, you have to buy photo eyes if you're able to operate those. Uh, so each individual piece adds up cost and then you have the cost of the gate panel and you get the cost of the post and everything and then you get your time of installing it and pretty soon you have a lot more involved in putting these in than you can realize. Now, luckily enough, we've gone and done another solar operator on the Stony Ridge Farm. So he's got some videos of the operator that we installed there as well as we have some more videos on our channel about a proper solar installation. And that one's even more major than the last one we showed you because we wanted to make sure it could have plenty of cycles. It was operating two really heavy duty operators and that just shows you kind of what goes into it. And I think the common misconception is, is that I get this operator and I'll be able to put it in really quick and easy. And that kind of goes to what we see when we look through their website too, website and Facebook page and things like that, which we've been to. Basically, they want to keep it super, super simple because they know that this is going to be an end user installing these things themselves, not professional uh, in installation. They want to keep the product as uh, low cost as they possibly can in the consumer's mind so that more and more people put these on. And we think that's a problem. I personally, in my opinion, think that's a problem. Um, we don't have a way with these particular systems to really terminate everything nicely like you saw in our other operator setup. We can't run conduits into this. Whoop! hang on, pause. Yes, yes, you can run conduits in these. However, they give you half inch knockout. So if you need to run some three quarter inch conduit, guess what, there's no room. If you need to run a bunch of half inch conduits, guess what, no room. They give you so little room that there's really no good room to run any kind of conduit over half inch. And I think they give you maybe two or three conduit uh, holes in there for those. And the box is so small that if you needed to run uh, several conduits, you wouldn't have the room. Now go look at some of our other operators and all the accessories. And once you start putting all the accessories on there that should be on there, there's no room in the box. That's what I'm alluding to. Yes, yes, they do give you like two or three half inch conduit knockouts for what that's worth. What you're gonna see when you see a consumer grade operator. You know, this looks pretty sloppy, but this is exactly what we're gonna see. We're gonna see wires that are stapled all over the place. It's just, get it up. Okay, pause. Oh, this is, boy, it's getting good now. Yes, yes, that's exactly what we see because they don't give you adequate knockouts. They don't give you, and really, their intent is not to have people use conduit. They don't plan on people using conduit, and this is clearly what you see when you go to their website because what do we see on their website? We see the boxes installed on the posts. We see wires just run straight into the, into the operator just like this. There's nothing ever running conduit. I think we looked through their entire website and only found one gate that had conduit and that was probably because an electrician brought power into the operator and so he was required to run conduit into the, the box. That was probably the only reason on that one singular photo that we could find on their website that there was conduit in the picture. They really don't plan on anybody ever using conduit. That's my opinion. My opinion is they don't plan on anybody using conduit. The post is here. We're gonna see all this stuff just plastered on the post right here because that's the post we have. Maybe if we're lucky, it's right over here. But because this is a minimalist system, we have very few wires coming into this. So we've got our solar panel right here. And here we've got hardwired inputs. Um, this is gonna be our operator wires right here. And we do have a probe that is going down this way. You can use probes or you can use something called a loop detector and people all uh, think that those loop detectors are in the roadway and they're pressure sensitive or they're doing something else. They're nothing more than a magnetic field that's sensing whether or not metal is in introduced into that field. Um, so that's a common misconception about loops. This is a probe and it's sensing the vehicles that are driving by. So there's two things that we're worried about when we're installing an operator is, is can it damage property and can it hurt a person? Now, if we look up the manual right here, uh, it tells us right here that we have two different types of entrapment protection that we need to be careful about entrapment protection. This is all the space in this entire manual that we get that talks about this. There might be a couple other places in the manual where they talk about entrapment protection and they talk about safety. What I was talking about is this is the only place in the manual where it talks specifically about entrapment protection and the type of force limiting devices that are installed on the operator. 
They don't talk about recommending any photo eyes for additional protection. I could not find anywhere in the manual, in the entire manual, where they talk about vehicle detection loops. They talk about probes, and probes are great. The way this probe is wired in there, all it can do is open the gate. It can't, so if we installed one of these probes on the outside of the gate, it would open the gate. And that would be a problem because it would allow people to get into the property that shouldn't be in the property. So there are different types of loops that are installed on these operators. There is a free exit loop, which means that once somebody's in the property and they've been allowed access into the property, it will open the gate and allow them to freely exit. Then there's something that we put at the, uh, just past the end of the gate, and that is called an obstruction loop. Then we have something to put underneath the gate that's called a safety loop, and that safety loop is only active when the gate's not in motion. Once the gate is in motion, that safety loop drops out and allows the gate to close. We talk more about that in the Stony Ridge video. Then on the outside of the gate, we have another obstruction loop. All these loops work for different functions. The only two that are the same are the inside and the outside of the obstruction loop, and those prevent the gate from closing on a vehicle. In conjunction with that, usually we have edges or we have eyes that can also uh, help prevent the gate from closing on a person or a vehicle. This gate has none of that stuff. It has a free exit probe. Once you get into the swing path of the gate, the gate really has no idea that anybody's there. And this is how almost, I can't say that I have ever seen one of these gates installed with any loops or with any eyes for that matter. And we'll get into that here in just a second. Like I mentioned, there's a problem with the eyes, the eye setup. But they do talk about safety. Um, they do the bare minimum to cover the requirements and let you know that these things can hurt people and that uh, it does have inherent entrapment sensors, but it doesn't talk about the risk that you run if you don't install the proper vehicle detection. Uh, so the risk that it can run of damaging property. It says that we have an inherent entrapment and then we have uh, force limiting and monitored contact. And so the monitored contact, they actually gives a, give us some monitored safeties right here. And the unique thing about this is this operator should not work without a monitored safety device. They've done something super special, as we mentioned in the beginning of the video, to get away from that. And the reason that they've done that is to keep it super, super simple and keep it super dumbed down for the common installer or the end user. They want to keep it as basic as they possibly can, and they know that monitored safety devices can cause a big problem. They can be a huge nuisance, so they want to get rid of those, and that's why they've done things the way they can. At least that's my opinion of why they've done things the way that they have, to keep it super simple, super basic, so that the end user can install their own product. All the other manufacturers out there, with the exception of maybe one or two, are requiring a monitored safety device to be installed before the gate will swing, and that's what I'm referring to here. Uh, so you either need to have a monitored edge or you need to have monitored photo eyes for that gate to swing freely or to work properly. And so on all the gates that we install, you're going to see one or both of those devices, or in some cases you may see multiples of those devices, depending on the circumstances and the, the safety concerns that we have regarding that particular installation. But these guys don't want you to install this stuff because they know that that's going to be problematic and that adds cost and stuff like that. So they're going to make their operator, they allow their operators to work without that stuff installed, as you can clearly see. What that means to you is, is that this, thing, this gate may or may not know that a vehicle's there, but it has no idea that a person's there. That is true. It, is, it has no idea that a person's there until it hits them. Once it hits them, then it can use one of the force limiting devices or the inherent entrapment sensor to determine that a person's there and it doesn't still know a person's there it just knows that the motor's working harder than it should and so it stops and says hmm, what the heck's going on here and no gate operator knows that it's technically a person there are contact and non-contact so a safety edge must come in contact with something before it can reverse path and a photo eye is going to be like on your garage door it'll break the beam and once that beam's broken it allows it makes the operator stop and it reverse course sensing that something's there and there may be an issue so the gate to swing freely and if the gate's trying to swing and it trips out that force setting it'll automatically reverse the gate so if it won't close all the way or something like that we can increase the force setting making it provide more pressure to close the gate if we back that off a little bit it'll take less pressure before it trips out and says hey something's in the way so uh, we'll play with that here in just a second and show you kind of what that is so the monitor in a non-contact, basically if you press on it hard enough, it trips the sensor and makes that gate reverse course. The other type is a non-contact sensor, and that's basically just like your garage door photo eyes. 
Um, it means that if something breaks that beam, then it's going to reverse. And so that's the things you're going to see us install on all your gates is we're either going to use gate edges or we're going to use photo eyes to prevent that gate from closing on a person. Now on something like this, there's not a high likelihood that it's going to hurt somebody, but you never want to open yourself up to that. But what it can do is it can seriously damage a vehicle. So you get this gate and you're thinking, oh, wow, I got a great deal on my gate operator. And then it goes and runs into the side of the car, tears up your whole your whole gate, whether it's a nice gate or not a nice gate, messes up your arm, you have to redo everything, and then you have to pay for a bunch of damage to somebody's vehicle. That's when the gate's not cheap. This becomes extremely important when you start talking large, heavy gates that are hard to stop. Uh, the gate that we've got on here is really light, but if you've got a gate moving with any kind of force, um, and you've got a small kid, it can cause a lot of injury very quickly. And there's a lot of cases across the US where exactly that same thing's happened. So I want to challenge anybody that's watching this video. If you have had one of these gates, hit your vehicle, drop a comment right now. We know that they're out there. We know there's thousands of them across the country. I went and visited somebody in North Carolina and they had told me and showed me their vehicle that was dented and scratched because one of these operators had closed on their vehicle. They're out there, it happens all the time, and it's because they're not installed correctly and they don't know the vehicles are there. Um, I'm gonna go out here and I'm gonna say something super controversial that this is, my, this is my opinion again. I wanna be very clear about that. My opinion is that these gates are such a piece of crap, they don't have enough force to actually hurt anybody seriously. They can barely do the job of closing the gate as it is, so the chances that it's really gonna crush somebody, it would have to be like a really close pinch point somewhere up there right by the operator. And so that anything's always possible. These gates are so weak and so underpowered and so poorly constructed that the chances that they're actually gonna be able to physically crush somebody, especially at the, at the other end of the gate, are pretty minimal, luckily. But the true cost comes when it damages a vehicle and it takes nothing to run that gate into a vehicle and cost you a new gate and a new arm. That is 100% accurate. I've heard stories of this all across the country. So like I say, I challenge you, if you've had one of these gates hit your vehicle, drop a comment down below and tell us your experience with these. So I want to talk about that because that's super important. But this is basically exactly what we see when people call us to their project and say, I need you to work on a gate. And that's exactly what they expect us that we're going to install. And they don't understand the difference between this and the other operator that we showed you. If you want to see the big difference between this and the other operator, we're going to drop a link right here somewhere. I, I don't know. Hold on a second, Mark. I got you. Let me put link below. Let me put in a few arrows for you. All right. There you go, my man. They're going to put a link to the video from the Stony Ridge Farmer, and we'll show you what a real high class operator looks like. Now, not saying you need something quite that fancy, but there's a huge difference between this and that product there. Um, so really people ask us how much a gate operator costs and it really depends on what you want the gate operator to do, how fancy you want it, the sky's the limit. We install gate operators from let's say $7,000 all the way up to a hundred plus thousand dollars. So it really depends on how fancy you want to get when you talk about uh, a gate operator. Uh, what you want it to do, how well you want it to function, how important is reliability, you know, redundancy, backup systems, things like that can add extra costs. So. Let's talk about the install. We're pretending that this is the outside of the gate on the unsecure side of the property. And we have our keypad mounted right here because you want to know why we put the keypad right here because there's a post right here and that's convenient. Um, a lot of times we'd see that actually on that side because that's the driver's side. And we wouldn't want to go set another post back here but that's another thing that doesn't meet UL325. This keypad and anything that you use to operate the gate needs to be placed a minimum of six feet away from any part of the gate operator. Ghost Controls actually in their manual does spell out the right requirement and that is the keypad needs to be more than six feet away from the, any operating portion of the gate. That is not correct. Ghost Controls does not recommend that. However, we found it really funny that when we went to their website, we could see some pictures where the keypad was actually installed right on the gate post, just like we were discussing. So if they're super serious about not installing gates improperly, maybe they want to step up their game on their website and take down the photos of the installations that don't meet UL325. Uh, just, just a tip. Um, people usually find it uh, disingenuous if you talk about how much you care about safety when you don't actually make sure that the installations you're featuring on your website are safe. Because they wouldn't want somebody reaching through the operator and trying to operate the keypad. So um, they're worried that somebody could come over here and try and operate a keypad or a doorbell button or something like that and get hung up in the gate and get hurt. 
And so that's why we want to maintain six feet away from the gate, which is basically a tall person's not going to be able to do both, either get into the gate and touch a keypad. So the keypad actually needs to be out here somewhere at a very bare minimum. Another thing we see a lot of is we don't see anything to stop this gate. So as it sets right now, this gate has no idea if there is a vehicle or a person anywhere in this swing path. We've got a probe out there that will open the gate and that's what a lot of people do because they're like, well, I wanna be able to drive up my driveway and have the gate open, but they don't think about what's gonna make that gate stop if it starts closing. And so they forget that they need a probe or something out here they need a probe on that side so that if somebody pull up to the gate and then they'll get sidetracked or something and that gate will start closing and run into the side of their vehicle and that's when you get damage. So on any gate that we're installing, we're gonna put uh, either a loop or a probe on the outside of the gate. Typically we use loops. We're gonna put one on that side of the gate that's called a shadow loop and that goes underneath the gate in the swing path of the gate and what that does is it works right up until the gate starts moving and then it drops out because if it didn't and that gate swung over since it's made of metal typically that gate swung over it would just automatically trip it and make it want to go back the other direction outside the swing path of the gate we have another loop and then further on down the driveway we'll have another loop so that could that's four loops that we're going to put in there that most homeowners or end users that install their own operators are not using nowhere in the manual did i see anything that talked about loops or their installation or how to install them uh, how to wire loop detectors into their system. Nowhere in their manual was there any discussion whatsoever of any kind of vehicle detection loops. They did talk about probes, but probes are not the same thing and probes don't serve the same purpose. Um, probes are really great for free exit and that's basically what the probes on their website are being sold for, is they're being sold as free exit devices. They are not selling any probes for obstruction uh, that I could see. So I'm sure they'll let me know if I'm wrong. The other thing, uh, I don't know where we covered it, but we talked about the eyes. I found it very interesting that the eyes that you go, yeah, sure, they sell the eyes on their website, but if you look on their eyes, it says right, in, and you go down and you follow all the information on the eyes, it says not for solar installations. So if you're installing a solar operator, one of their solar operator systems, you can't use the eyes. And it specifically says that right on their website. I've got screenshots of it that says the eyes are not for solar operations. So if you want to have eyes on your gate for entrapment protection, that's not even an option for solar. And I would guess probably 95% of their operators are being operated off of solar. Um, it may even be higher than that. That's just simply a guess. It's just my gut feeling based on what I've seen in the field because all of their operators are solar and that's also why most retailers don't carry the eyes is because they're not a big seller because you can't use them in solar operators and the problem goes on and on. So that's because they're the huge draw that they take. So they're constantly taking power off of that and these operators barely run. Um, if you get a cloudy day, chances are they're not gonna run. The operator that we put in for Stony Ridge, he talked about the as soon as it reached 20 degrees, which you draw a lot more power, it takes a lot more power to keep those things running in cold. Um, so all of those are a factor. Things like keypads take power, photo eyes take power, loop detectors take power. Oh, what else takes power? Just about everything that you can put, any accessory you can put on these, which is why they keep it very limited because they know that the 10 watt solar panel that they're giving you is barely enough to keep that thing running on a good sunny day, especially out here in the west, uh, in the northwest where we don't have a whole lot of sunlight, especially in the winter time, uh, these gates go down all the time because they just don't have the backup battery reserve. If they put photo eyes on there, they'd never work. Each one of those costs money, takes time. You have to do more trenching, things like that. And so those oftentimes uh, don't get installed and that makes for a very dangerous installation. So we got the solar panel and the battery box kit and it comes with two seven amp hour batteries. So that gives you a total of 14 amp hours. It's a little overcast today, so far it's stayed charged. But if we see a lot of cycles or it gets super cold, those batteries drain even faster. And we will see people that say, you know, it's been overcast for three days and I can't get my gate to work. That's why you see us when we install those, we're putting a lot more battery capacity with a lot bigger solar panels in there so that we make sure that no matter what happens, what time of year it is, no matter what the weather conditions are. So there's calculations that most of the operator companies will do and they'll give you calculations based on your draw and everything and how many cycles a day you think that gate's gonna move. And so when they sell you a package, they're taking all of those things into consideration to make sure that you have the backup reserve. Now, one company that we did see, and I don't know when this video is going to come out, but we went and saw US Automatic, who does a really good job of making sure that their operators 
work very well and have very low draw. So all of their accessories are super low draw and that would be a very good comparable product as opposed to this particular product. They're very focused on their safety. They're focused on things that don't rob a lot of power so that they can use smaller solar panels and still keep the gate running. I think they were using a 30, maybe a 30 amp hour battery instead of a two seven amp hour battery. So we will put a link to a package, a solar package, both a single and a dual gate package uh, in the video description down below. So if you're interested in a good alternative to these operators, we'll show you one. US Automatic, made in Texas. Uh, they've kind of been a pioneer in their industry for a very long time and they actually put out a product that can be used when installed properly will be very safe. So we think that that's a good alternative to something like this that is, uh, in our opinion, not safe enough. Gate for a long period of time, um, should there not be enough sun. It's been overcast for about two days, but we really haven't used this gate either. So when we set the limits of this, uh, that was one of the things I didn't particularly care for as I showed up today and on most of the operators, most, I can't think of one that doesn't, isn't this way, but we can set the open and the close limit. On this gate, we can only set the close limit and the open limit is basically when the rod is sucked all the way in, that's the open limit. There's no recommendation from this particular manufacturer, Ghost Controls, to install better hinges. That's a fly! Okay. They actually do talk about better hinges once you get over 200 pounds. So in the manual, they talk about any gates that are over 200 pounds, you need better hinges, and that's probably because it's an underpowered piece of Because the gate's so underpowered, it can't swing, it's gonna have a hard time running a gate that heavy, and so they really need good hinges, so they talk about it at that point in time. But anything under 200 pounds, which this gate clearly is, there's no recommendation that you do anything other than whatever your gate comes with, any hardware will work. And what we see there is they're just super sloppy. Um, Stony Ridge Farmer showed us his gate. I mean, there's slop all over the place. It's just not a tight system. They do recommend good hinges as long as it's over 200 pounds, but we recommend good hinges regardless of how heavy your gate is because it takes up a lot of that slop and that play, it allows your gate to close more accurately in the same spot every time, and just reduces wear and tear on the operator because there's not as much friction, so. And so the heavier your gate is, the more important that is. We, even on a simple ranch gate, will install a good pair of hinges that costs about $100 just because we want to make sure that swings as freely and easily as possible so that there's no friction and it just eliminates wear and tear. This is typically what we're going to see, just the standard hinges. If you're looking for a good set of hinges for your gate, they're called Badass Hinges and uh, we'll put a link to those in the description down below and they're made by D&D. Really good solid gate hinge. Another one that we use a lot is called a LiftMaster Power Hinge. So two very good options depending on how heavy your gate is. Um, but that's, that's a good hinge option for any, any swing gate. They do put a buzzer, um, which is another warning device that's required. You gotta have lights or buzzers or something like that. So they do have a uh, nice buzzer here. They do give you some remotes. Now, one of the nice things about most of the systems we install will oftentimes work with your vehicle remotes. So if you've got the vehicle remotes inside built into your vehicle, you can program one of those to your gate operator with what we install. If you don't, we can program, we can give you remotes that'll work for your garage doors, like a three button remote that'll work with your garage doors and work with your gate. So that's a little bit of a plus instead of having to carry on the whole separate remote. Um, other things we can do that these guys aren't gonna be able to do is make it so that you can open your gate and control your gate with an app. We're gonna label this one false. I misspoke right there, they do have an app. If you wanna buy one of these operators, luck be with you. They do have an app. You can operate this thing remotely and crash it into all the vehicles you want uh, remotely. Um, have a good time with that because they do offer that feature. So if you just wanna sit up in your house and randomly open and close your gate on vehicles, that's 100% something you can do. So lucky you. Timer on on this, which it does have a built-in timer. Um, it isn't gonna give you a seven day timer or anything like that. So if you wanted it to be open from eight to five, you're not gonna have any of that functionality with this. Uh, another way that they keep the cost down is the only thing they offer is gonna be a wireless keypad. We're not a big fan of wireless keypads. Um, in the right application, they can work great, but usually we provide wired keypads and that just gives 100% reliability as opposed to having any kind of uh, signal interference that can cause um, reliability issues. Wireless keypads can at times be problematic so um, that's just our experience, that's my opinion. I prefer a wired keypad in, in any case where I can actually get one but it does require more trenching, more conduit, more work and 
That's why they don't offer one. Uh, not saying that you can't even wire a keypad. I'm sure that uh, we could get a keypad wired in there. Uh, it's just not something that you're going to be able to buy through them. Thing about this is made so that you can install it as quickly and easily as possible and hopefully have it work most of the time. Do you want to know why we install the loops and stuff like that? I think you do. I think you want to see why we do that. So what we see when people see a gate closing, we know that the best course of action is to just pause, just put on the brakes, just stop, let the gate hit your vehicle very gently and pause until it finally reverses course. However, what happens in the real world is people try and race the gate. They see the gate closing, they panic and they gun it. That's what happens every time. It's just normal human reaction. And that's why what you're about to see is exactly what happens. And this is where the real damage comes in is because people end up trying to race the gate. They don't just break and pause and that creates that little wedge action. And like what you're gonna see is, is the gate hangs up on the bumper. And this is, this is a real world scenario of what could happen. So I don't care what you say, that's my opinion. This is what we see in the field. This has happened in any cases. So if you've seen this happen, drop us a comment. Uh, and let us know because I think what you're going to see is this comment section fill up with people that have had this very experience. Yeah, I'm going to use the nice car. What if something happens to it? Oh, nothing will. We've installed that gate as per the manufacturer's recommendation. How could anything bad happen? Mostly as per the manufacturer's recommendation. Some things were done just homeowner ad lib. Uh, we, we did kind of shoot from the hip, kind of homeowner style there on a couple things. Um, so. There are some things that are done not per the manufacturer's recommendation. I need to be very clear about that. But uh, we've hopefully pointed all those inconsistencies out through this video. And so now you know what's per the recommendation and what is not. Oh crap, that thing's gonna close on my vehicle. Dude, did you see that? I did. That thing tried to close on my vehicle. Man, that's the last time I come to your house. We better, I'm gonna have to check for damage. See, that gate had no idea I was there. That's your fault. That's 100% on you. I was just minding my own business, doing what I was supposed to be doing. What typically happens in these cases is, is that we'll be sitting here and then somebody will come along and go, hey, how you doing? I haven't seen you in so long. Oh, by the way, did you get that letter that I sent you the other day? And then all of a sudden, oh crap, that gate's gonna close on me again. Oh crap. True. Son of a gun. Son of a gun. Except for maybe the letter. It would have been an email or something. Because this is going to get real now. Look. Look at what it's done to my vehicle. There was not a scratch on this. This thing was meant before your gate damaged my vehicle. None of this was there. Oh, you want to argue? You want to argue with me? I'll show you. I'll show you. Don't argue with me, it's your gate's fault. You know what, that gate's never gonna hurt anybody ever again because I took care of it for you. Yeah, that's right. Now let's talk about all the damage you did to my pretty car. <laughs> that's all I have to say about that and you have a good dang day. So hopefully by now, like at the very end there, maybe you've figured out that some of what we do is a little bit tongue in cheek and we're a little edgy. Um, so we always like to add a little comedy into things. I'm sure that if you're from Spooky Controls, you probably don't find much of this very funny and we can't help it if you don't have a good sense of humor, but maybe it will make you think about the way you market your products and about the safety of your products because a lot of what we've seen in here is what actually happens in the field. And maybe if you haven't seen this stuff, you haven't been out in the field, so maybe you need to go follow some installers around and, and see what we see when we um, install these things. The other thing I will say in full disclosure is, is that our company has not always followed UL325. We have kind of stepped up our game over the years and we have always tried to be at the forefront. So back in the early days, we just installed gates, much like many people, and then have slowly tried to bring our game up and so the gates that we install now are better than the gates we were installing five years ago. And when we go back to one of our old installations and if we, if we have done something incorrectly or we haven't followed UL325, we bring those gates up to code so that anything moving forward is up to code. And I think that's probably what a large part of the country and the quality operator installers out there are doing. So 
I'm not going to say that we don't have any gate operators out there that are not up to today's code, but we are constantly improving what we do and bringing better quality and safety to our customers um, through education. And as we learn more, we bring that into our installations. So don't hear me say that we're perfect and we've never installed a gate that wasn't 100% perfectly safe and had all the safeties because that would be a lie. So hopefully that clears up some of the inconsistencies in the real, or the original video and we've cleared up what is fact, what is fiction, what is my opinion versus what is reality, what is in their manual, what isn't in their manual, and hopefully I get this right. I'm sure that if I didn't, I'll get another letter and then we'll have to sort all this stuff out all over again, but I'm willing to take that risk. I'm a risk taker. Until next time, you have a good dang day. Good for that. Anyhow, I got the flip-flops on, so uh, hashtag flip-flop fencer. It's good stuff. Okay, that's it.